welcome to the lecture number 4 on the in the module of on energy and environment under the ecology and environment course. My name is uh, Srinivas Jayanti, I am a professor in chemical engineering department. We had uh, already 3 lectures in this series. In the first lecture we looked at the connection nexus between uh, energy and environment. In the second lecture we looked uh, at uh, in detail about what uh, where the energy is coming from and what kind of demand is expected from energy in the coming years. In the third lecture, we looked at uh, the pollutants that emerge from uh, uh, energy harvesting from nature. In this lecture, we are going to uh, continue further and look at uh, the pressing problem of global warming, uh, which is attributed to anthropogenic causes, especially to the uh, harnessing of energy from fossil fuels and uh, uh, other sources, other human related activities. In uh, the first lecture, we looked at how the energy demand has been increasing year by year, right from uh, 1970s and how it is expected to increase for the coming uh, several years and also how most of the energy has been coming and is expected to, to continue to come from fossil fuels, coal, natural gas and oil. And we also saw that when we draw energy from a coal power plant, we have a number of emissions in terms of sulphur dioxide, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, particulates and aerosols of trace elements all of which can give rise to a number of uh, uh, immediate uh, health and environmental problems. And we also saw that despite this uh, uh, fear about carbon dioxide emissions, we have a, a, a large increase in uh, uh, continued increase in carbon dioxide emissions which came up to 14 and gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, in the year 2010 and that these emissions are coming from all sectors of human activity from transport industry, energy and buildings and uh, agricultural activities, industrial activities all these things are contributing to uh, carbon dioxide emission. So, carbon dioxide emission is has permeated into the human life. Uh, uh, in a very involved way, but the fact remains that in the modern era in the past 50 years we see increasing rate of emissions and uh, large increases in carbon dioxide concentration and uh, methane and uh, nitrous oxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. These concentrations are still very low, carbon dioxide concentration is only 0.04 percent by volume and these concentrations are so low that they do not pose a direct danger to us in terms of their uh, toxicity. But we have been accumulating carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere at uh, such a high rate that uh, it is believed by a number of experts scientific experts uh, uh, and the scientific community that uh, this is actually caused a net radiative forcing of the order of 2 to 3 watt per meter square compared to about uh, 340 watt per meter square of uh, incident solar energy onto the upper reaches of the atmosphere. So, it is only about 1 percent or less, but still this has given rise to uh, an increasing in the uh, atmospheric temperature of the order of 0 0.5 to uh, 1 degree centigrade. And this has led to huge accumulation of uh, thermal energy in earth's climate system in the upper oceans, deeper oceans, in the ice, land and also atmosphere. And as a result of this, it is expected to have serious consequences, these small temperature changes are expected to have uh, serious consequences on the physical systems 
that are there on the earth like the glaciers, snow, ice, permafrost, rivers, coastal areas, sea level rises, erosion of coastal areas and also biological systems, terrestrial ecosystems, wildfire, marine ecosystems and also human and managed systems like food production, livelihoods, health and economics. All these factors are influenced by these sort of changes uh, uh, that have been happening which are attributed to our continued emissions of carbon dioxide and uh, other greenhouse gases in the process of energy harvesting which is needed for our economic prosperity. So, there lies the conflict between and energy environment. In order to find possible uh, midway path between and energy environment, we would like to take a close look at what is this, uh, what this global warming uh, is about and we would like to understand the scales, the orders of magnitude of the problem and uh, see what kind of solutions are possible. So, in this lecture we are going to look specifically at the global warming problem and what is behind it and uh, what kind of message it has for us. Okay. So, this uh, uh, issue of global warming has been uh, under worldwide study of scientific scientists across the world uh, under the forum of IPCC, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, which is celebrating its 30th year this year. And so, it has been under study, continuous uh, study with improvements and improvements and revisions over the past three decades and even more. And uh, these have produced a report, uh, I think in 20 latest report, which has a, a very detailed analysis as of climate change 2014. And it has uh, a lot of analysis on observed changes and their causes in the atmosphere, climate, future climate changes, risks and impacts and also it suggests certain pathways for adaptation, mitigation and sustainable development. So, all these aspects are important when we deal with the global warming and we would like to look at some of the contents of this report for us to understand the science behind it and the causes behind it and the time scales involved, the magnitudes of uh, uh, effort that is required that is involved, uh, all these things we can get, uh, uh, we would like to get a an understanding of these issues by looking at some of the evidence that is presented here and some of the reasoning that is presented in this. So, we are going to look at uh, a series of uh, pictures extracted from this report uh, and I would uh, really suggest this 1500 page report as a, uh, as a reading material for anybody interested in uh, uh, climate science and uh, uh, its multifarious effects on the global warming problem. It is a very detailed report, contains lots of analysis and uh, lots of observations, lots of data using very many sophisticated techniques and uh, uh, it is a great compilation of current understanding of the global warming problem. Okay, so, I would uh, really recommend it to uh, all of you and I hope uh, some of you will be able to go through it in bits and uh, pieces. It is freely downloadable from www.ipcc.ch. If you go through many of those uh, uh, options, you will be able to get uh, download the full report completely freely. <coughs> okay. So, let us come back to this uh, first picture here where we are talking about the global mean energy budget and here the energy is what we are getting from solar uh, uh, source and uh, more than 99.8 percent of the total energy that we get is coming from the sun and uh, a small amount uh, is coming from uh, the heat released by the core inner core of the earth and even smaller smaller amount is coming from other radiation than solar energy. So, sun is the main provider and probably the only provider of energy for us in large quantities that are as required by us. So, the sun's uh, energy can be considered in terms of 
watts per meter square 300 watts per meter square of surface area of the earth this varies uh, uh, in a number of ways but on the average this is uh, what it is and it's been fairly constant uh, over the several decades um, at least and uh, uh, 340 watts per meter square is incident at the upper reaches of the atmosphere and then as it goes through atmosphere it gets modulated in a number of ways by our atmosphere by what is happening on the earth's surface and what is happening what has happened before also as we will see. So, out of the 340 79 waters, uh, watts per meter square is absorbed in the atmosphere and uh, uh, a net of 100 watts per meter square. So, that is about uh, 30 percent is reflected uh, back into the outer space and 185 so, uh, rough slightly more than half is reaching the ground and 24 of that is reflected back as short wave uh, uh, radiation reflected from uh, the Antarctic ice, Arctic ice and uh, uh, a number of from uh, the land, from the ocean all these things this is known as the albedo. So, all of this contribute to diff, uh, reflection of the incident light without any modulation. And so, we have only less than half 161 watts per meter square coming onto the uh, surface where it gets uh, uh, transformed in a number of ways, it gets absorbed into the surface, it leads to evaporation from the land from the sea and then it also contributes to sensible heating of the atmosphere and then it is also it maintains a certain temperature of the earth's surface because of uh, its temperature it emits radiation to the extent of 398 watt per meter square and uh, this is reflected back into the atmosphere and a significant portion is emitted back 342 is emitted back into the earth's surface and a net amount of 239 is what is lost into the space. So, what is lost into the space as thermal radiation as long wave radiation plus what is reflected as short wave radiation is almost balanced by what is coming here 340 there is a small difference that is 0 0.6 watt per meter square is supposed to be the imbalance which is going into the uh, uh, earth surface. This, this has been the way for centuries, but it is not always been like that. Uh, there were times of course, when the oxygen concentration was minuscule and carbon dioxide concentration was as much as 10 percent. So, this 10,000 ppm. So, it is not that uh, life things have been the same way as there are uh, number of causes for this climate change natural and also human related anthropogenic. So, there are natural fluctuations in the solar output and uh, the aerosols the minute particles that are present in the atmosphere contribute a significant amount in terms of capturing the solar uh, short wave radiation and also uh, reflecting it and then uh, also in the long wave uh, range. These aerosols can be generated by us by human activities they can also be generated by natural activities like volcanic eruptions and then wind storms and uh, uh, number of fires natural fires all these things can generate aerosols. And then you can also have clouds we know clouds are formed in many different ways and then you can have ozone which is a substantial gas which interferes with this process and we have heard of ozone fluctuations caused by number of factors and then you have the culprits that we are interested in uh, uh, the greenhouse gases and large aerosols some of which many of which are uh, contributed to by our human activities. And then you also have vegetation changes on the earth's surface and ice and snow cover during winter time during summer time as it changes as the cover changes then you can have changes ocean color wave height are also uh, causes for 
the surface albedo that is amount of uh, wave uh, that is reflected and I would like to point out here that we are looking at 340 watt per meter square as the amount that is coming into the upper reaches and for example, what is reflected by the earth surface is 24 watt per meter square and what is attributed to anthropogenic causes the radiative forcing which can be compared with this is only of the order of 2 to 3 watt per meter square. So, it is only about a tenth of what is reflected by natural causes uh, uh, on the earth surface. So, in that sense we are looking at small changes in, in terms of this, but it is not very simple as it is being too small and uh, things like that. There are other uh, reasons for it, but let us postpone that discussion short time and uh, complication arising is uh, 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 from a number of physical phenomena that happen. For example, you can have snow ice albedo effect, long wave radiation and the lapse rate. So, that is the rate at which the temperature decreases, clouds, water vapor, emission of non CO2 greenhouse gases and aerosols air sea carbon dioxide exchange, air land carbon dioxide exchange in the process of uh, vegetation growth and all that, bio geophysical process and peat and permafrost decomposition as temperature uh, uh, of the earth changes of the atmosphere changes. Then uh, uh, these kind of vegetal matter can decompose giving rise to emissions of uh, uh, these GHG gases. So, there are all these factors which contribute to uh, which are affecting uh, the way the temperature uh, evolves as a result of increase or decrease in concentrations of this GHG gases and also as a result of minute changes in the temperature of the, uh, uh, of the atmosphere, temperature of the upper uh, uh, layers of the, of the uh, oceans and uh, the land and so on. So, out of this you can see there are some positives which mean that as a result of this you will have increase in uh, temperature and then there are also negatives which can uh, decrease which can lead to decrease in air temperature. So, as a result of all these things there has been continual change in the atmospheric concentration over millions of years well well before man was born. And this is one such uh, 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 part of the data uh, coming from a number of sources other than direct evidence, direct measurement. Obviously, it is so far back into the uh, years, we are looking at 60 million years and you can see that there was a time at which carbon dioxide concentration was in excess of 50 to uh, 500 to 1000 ppm there are error bars, but there is there has been a, a, a much higher concentration and over the past 40 million years there has been a steady decrease in this and uh, a fairly constant uh, variation over the last 10 to uh, 20 million years ago. And here we have uh, this is where we are really interested in and this particular reduction is attributed to a natural cause which uh, leads to where we are which is the uh, collision of India, the Indian subcontinent uh, uh, leading to the formation of the Himalaya mountain range is uh, supposed to have led to a large absorption of carbon dioxide in the natural weathering process. Uh, uh, so, as to decrease the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide as a result of which we had cooling here and this cooling is supposed to be uh, related to the formation of uh, what we now call as India and of course, other neighboring countries. And uh, so, there have been natural causes which have led to large scale changes in the carbon dioxide uh, concentration. Coming back to uh, a closer range of uh, um, 0 to 3 million years ago. Okay, so, uh, we can see sea level changes, atmospheric concentration changes and uh, you see variations here of the order of between 200 and uh, 400 ppm 
they have been like this, but uh, uh, variations and you can see global sea level variation is given by this compared to present level of 0, there have been significant decreases of the order of minus 100 meters. So, sea level has been rising and falling, rising and falling by tens of meters naturally well before man has had its his footprint or uh, evil hand into this. And we also see large scale changes of much larger amplitude almost of the order of 100 meters happening in the last 500,000 years uh, uh, like this here. And we also see large scale fluctuations here of the sea surface temperature okay. uh, and then uh, other dust accumulation which is actually leading to these kind of observations here. So, there have been changes of the things that we have been uh, looking at and this is more of the recent past where there is more of direct evidence uh, uh, in the form of uh, ice cores that have been dug up in uh, various places. And uh, from these things you can find variation of sea level, variation of Antarctic temperature with respect to the present and then sea surface temperature in the tropicals uh, thing, carbon dioxide concentrations and also what is expected to be one of the uh, causes of this climate changes in, the, in uh, the present times which is the precession of earth. Uh, uh, around the sun is supposed to cause a small change in terms of the radiation that is received. And uh, there has been some evidence to say that these have had the corresponding changes in these. And these also uh, seem to show that present day climate of this uh, last million years ago is far more susceptible to these kind of changes which have led to changes systematic changes in the carbon dioxide concentration and temperature changes of the order of several degrees, a few degrees at least, sea level changes of the order of uh, 100 uh, uh, meters have happened in the recent, in the previous 800,000 years, 8 lakh years, 0 0.8 million years. Okay. So, this is an evidence that is, uh, that has um, stood scrutiny of a number of scientists and uh, um, so this is something that is both uh, 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 a cause for worry and also uh, uh, an assurance that things will not go uh, so so much out of hand okay so there is uh, that that kind of uh, thing and uh, if you look at one of the headline figures in terms of the sea level changes in the recent past and what we are looking at is the rate of sea level changes. So, about 20,000 uh, years ago there is a rate of sea level change of the order of about 12 millimeters per year okay. and uh, around 15,000 years ago there is a specific climatic event during which the rate of sea level change was as high as 40 mi millimeters per year. And over the last 2000 years it is minuscule, you can see that it is 0.2 uh, millimeters per year. And in the 20th century we have 1.7 uh, millimeters per year. So, this is very small compared to the changes that have taken place about 15,000 years ago and of course, man was there, but man was not there uh, leading to such a large footprint in terms of carbon dioxide emissions 15,000 years ago. So, it is these uh, that is why we can say that these are assurances that much larger scale changes have happened in the recent past and man himself has faced them. Of course, there is uh, uh, a lot of consequences on the human population and uh, at one time uh, during one of these events uh, it is said that there has been almost a decimation of the human population at that time. So, that is 90 decimation is coming down to a level of 10 percent of that. 
okay, but large scale ext almost uh, extension type of event uh, consequences have happened. And so, the consequences of this can be very large for small changes in this in the atmospheric temperature. And when we say small changes in this, we are talking about changes to the order of 4 degrees in the sea surface temperature. So, are these kind of things possible and is there credibility? If you look at the changes that have happened in the last 150 years in terms of temperature change, it has gone up from minus 0 0.6 to about 0 0.2. So, it is about 0 0.8 degrees centigrade over the last 100 years over the last 150 uh, years. But a worrying trend is that over the last 50 years, it has been rising at a fairly large rate and sea level change in the last century has been from minus 0 0.15 to about 0 0.05. So, that is about 20 centimeters it has risen. So, on the face of it okay, when you look at these figures whether it is carbon dioxide concentration or sea level change temperature changes 1 2 degrees what what is the big deal because there are seasonal changes which are much more rapid and much much higher and we have sea level change of 0.2 millimeters uh, 0.2 meters. 20 centimeters in 1100 years is hardly anything for us to uh, worry about. This is something that uh, on the face of it, it looks like this, but the consequences of this on the whole are supposed to be uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, much more uh, uh, harmful and uh, some of these are predicted by the global climate models because of the complexities that are involved in uh, the agents that contribute to change of climate and uh, 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 the number of different uh, factors that come into picture. There has been a concerted attempt or uh, going back to 40, 50 years towards developing uh, global climate models and uh, early studies have linked only the atmosphere land and uh, ocean surface, but uh, gradually we have other factors like aerosols coming into picture, the carbon cycle, vegetation, the dynamic vegetation and some atmospheric chemistry, land ice, all these factors have been gradually uh, 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 included into this. Uh, for example, when we look at uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentration, we really have to understand how, how much carbon dioxide there is, how much carbon dioxide, how it changes. When you look at this carbon cycle, we have here uh, stock of carbon in, uh, uh, so that is the amount of carbon stored in different uh, strata of the upper uh, parts of the earth's surface and the atmosphere. And then we also have fluxes because the amount that is there in any particular reservoir is not constant, it is being con continuously exchanged with other reservoirs, so that there is a, a carbon cycle. So, you have atmosphere and uh, the atmosphere and the ocean surface are in constant uh, uh, exchange of carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide can dissolve in the uh, sea water and then uh, uh, go into bicarbonate form or bicarbonates getting converted to carbonate forms and uh, carbon dioxide can also be taken by vegetation on the uh, sur surface and when vegetal matter or animal matter decomposes or when you have a wildfire, you can have carbon dioxide generation and then you can have volcano volcanic eruptions. Uh, giving rise to both uh, uh, direct uh, evolution of carbon dioxide, but also more importantly some of the minerals which come out onto the surface and lead to carbon dioxide absorption, there is the possibility. And this volcanic eruptions also cause distribution of uh, very fine scale aerosols into the atmosphere which play, which uh, 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 interact with the incoming solar radiation from the uh, sun 
and also outgoing solar radiation from uh, uh, from the earth and then lead to accumulation or or release of carbon uh, uh, this and then you have vegetal matter becoming uh, deposits and then forming the earth's surface earth's crust and then all these things these are all and fossil fuel reserves that are there maybe a kilometer 2 kilometers uh, inside uh, the uh, from the uh, earth surface these are all carbon reserves so carbon is found on the earth crust and in the atmosphere in very, in very many dis different forms in gaseous form in dissolved form in water in uh, transformed solids in the form of vegetation and also in terms of fossils in terms of carbonates in rocks so there are all these kind of things and each of these has uh, a time scale uh, uh, of uh, interaction so that if you were to release a certain amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere now then it gets slowly slowly evacuated by this natural process for example you have 5000 uh, uh, 10 to the power 15 grams of carbon that is released into this into the atmosphere and a substantial portion about 30 percent is slowly absorbed into land and into the atmosphere into the ocean over 200 years and then over 2000 years some more of that will go and you still have about 30 40 percent of the original carbon dioxide still left in the atmosphere here and uh, some amount has gone into the land and more amount has gone into the ocean and uh, after slow reaction uh, with calcium uh, oxide to form calcium uh, carbonates it becomes uh, solidified so after 10000 years you still have about 15 percent of carbon dioxide still left here and then you have uh, uh, some in uh, land and the rest in this so you have slow evacuation of carbon dioxide so this this causes in our time scales an accumulation so if our rate of release of carbon dioxide is significant is large then there can be accumulation and that is what we are seeing here and this is what is actually the cause of concern for us as shown by uh, climate models and these climate models show that there is going to be a continued increase in the carbon dioxide concentration uh, for example uh, here carbon dioxide concentration from 2000 is of the order of uh, close to 400 uh, ppm 380 but if our current rate of emission of carbon dioxide continues for the next 100 years then it may go up to 1000 it may trouble that is if we do not take any action now it can go up to 3 times what it is and more uh, uh, concern showing concern and taking some measures may take it up to double okay so if we retain it at our current levels and not go through the increases that we have seen then it may lead up to uh, doubling of carbon dioxide concentration okay so there are other scenarios which say that okay you can they'll continue to grow up but if we take very strong action in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emissions and going towards near carbon zero uh, emissions then over the next 50 years they continue to grow but gradually decrease like this so uh, back into this and bringing it back towards this to 300 to 400 uh, ppm level is a humongous task for which you have to go into almost carbon zero type of emissions and we know that that is a, a very big challenge and that is the challenge that we are faced with that is if we continue our conventional 20th century way of life in where we are continuing to extract uh, uh, consume more and more energy and continue to extract more and more energy from fossil fuels and if we continue to cater to our economic prosperity goals and needs in the conventional way then by the end of this century we are going to see three times the level of carbon dioxide that is there and that is expected to increase the temperature by almost 5 degrees 5 to 6 degrees centigrade 
over the past 1000 year average and that is a huge degree change because we have seen in uh, some of the past cases that the sea level changes have been uh, like several tens of meters. Okay. So, it is not sea level is not going to change so rapidly in our current thing it is a big question mark, but there are other causes like increased uh, uh, heat waves and increased cyclones destructions and tidal waves and all these kind of things are expected to happen. The climate the immediate climate and uh, the way the uh, rainfall patterns precipitation patterns and the way that we are fed with water for agriculture needs drinking water needs these are going to be affected by sm uh, small changes uh, fractional degree changes one or two degree changes in the uh, ocean temperature. So, that is where we have a problem not in terms of absolute concentration of carbon dioxide or absolute level of the sea level or the amount of uh, 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 small degrees of 1 or 2 degrees increase in temperature. It is not the direct impact on the human beings that is of concern to us, but indirect impact on natural process on which we depend for our daily life. So, that is the biggest concern. So, in the next lecture we are going to see what we can do about it, what how we can uh, uh, live with it and how we can try to mitigate the consequences and uh, what we can do to make to not make them more worse than what they can be. Okay, thank you.